Am I on now? Between services, I keep forgetting to turn it off. And so they have to turn it off in the back. Okay. And so then I, then I come up here and I turn it off. Hey, uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, whatever it is right now. It feels like uh, the sun. So good that day. Um, how many of you guys are here for more services because you wanted the free air conditioning? Do we have anybody in there? <laughs> Go to a couple services. Uh, let's, uh, let me pray for us right now uh, for the word. Lord, we thank you so much for the power of your word. Lord, we thank you you that in your word is the truce for life. Lord, we get the secrets on how to live in your reward and your blessing and in, in your eternal life now. We pray that you would open up our ears and our hearts to hear what your word has to tell us. Amen. All right, guys, so I um, like to laugh, <laughs> and uh, I think you guys know that. Um, one thing that I do a lot is uh, I, when I do sermon prep, I go online, I look at funny things. And um, you guys ever watch that show, uh, Kids Say the Darndest Things? Okay, great, wonderful, love it. I typed that into uh, Google, and I got some of the greatest kid sayings, and I want to start off by reading some of these. You guys ready for these? Yeah. We all have our own. I'm going to end with two of my own, but I'm, I'm going to give you some of these. Um, seven-year-old, mom, what's a humanitarian? Six-year-old. Oh, I know, I know, I know. It's like a vegetarian, but they eat humans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, point for that kid. Mother, she's talking to her little kid child. Do you want the baby to be a boy or a girl? Little kid. I want the baby to be Batman. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's another good one. This two-year-old. Mommy, I'm all grown up now. Mommy, no, not yet, you aren't. You're still my little girl. Then the two-year-old little girl, as she's walking into the kitchen, nope, I'm all grown up, and I'm going to touch knives. <laughs> <laughs> you can't touch knives until you're all grown up, so she's grown up. Okay, here's mine. You guys ready for mine? My oldest child, these are both from my oldest child. He's four years old, same year. He had a rotten year with his mouth. Okay, same year, he's four years old. Um, he's sitting there with my mother-in-law, and they're sitting at, the, uh, at the, the table at her house. And my mother-in-law had just got a sunburn. You know that, that time when you have a sunbur sunburn, and it's like almost peeling, not peeling yet, but trying to peel? So my son's sitting there, and he looks at her, and he's like, you're old, aren't you? <laughs> and um, my mother-in-law laughs. She's like, yeah, how can you tell? Now, first off, don't ever ask that question <laughs> to a little four-year-old. But she did, and without skipping a beat and all the confidence in the world, he says, your rusty skin. <laughs> well, horrible. <laughs> okay, here's, here's something that he said to my mom. My mom, uh, they're at, uh, at her house, and they're, um, she had given him, uh, bought him a rubber band gun, and he's going around and shooting everything, killing bad guys and monsters and all that kind of stuff all throughout the house. And she's sitting at the table feeding one of my other children, and she notices, hey, I don't hear very much. So she pays attention, and, she, and all of a sudden she hears this deep, heavy breathing. And she turns around, and she sees my four-year-old son, gun pointing to her head. He yells, die, old lady. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. But to his, in his defense, he was just mimicking what my dad did moments earlier. So, no, he didn't do that. You know what's funny about that right now? Like, there was, like, this low laugh, and then, the, and then all of a sudden, a couple of minutes later, like, a seconds later, a big laugh. They just got it. Okay. All right. Kids say whatever comes to their mind, don't they? We all have stories about our kids. Honestly, so many of them we couldn't say from the pulpit. They just say whatever comes out of their mouth. They don't know how to hold back. They don't know what to say and what not to say. But as we get older, things change, don't they? All of a sudden, we start running by a new rule, and that rule is the rule of not saying anything. Is that true? You know, sometimes we hold our mouth way too much. We don't speak our mind often enough, and we hold back on the worry of offending people. You know, you could say that right now in society, there is this growing trend that it is a human right to not be offended. Crazy world we live in. 
I want to talk about that. I want to talk when should we say something, when should we speak up, and when should we hold our mouths. Now, there's a new word, an, an, an old word that's taken a new meaning, and it's been spoken of so much over the last five years, and that is the word tolerance. I have heard the word tolerance more over the last five years than the first 30 years of my life. It's, it's talked about from um, pulpits, from politicians, from celebrities. Oh, and I want to look at that. This, that's where we're going today. Tolerance. Is it a sin or is it a virtue? We need to decide this. Now, uh, if you listen to politicians, well, actually, let's see what some politicians and celebrities say about this word tolerance. Uh, let's get that first one up here. This is our old uh, U.S. Attorney General, Loretta Lynch. How many of you guys thought you'd be going to church and I'd be preaching on Loretta Lynch? Anybody here? <laughs> this is what she says, our, U, our Attorney General. I think, that the ov- I think that overall, like the main thing, overall, the position on a whole host of issues should always be towards inclusion and equality. It should always be towards tolerance and accepting everything. U.S. Attorney General. Let's look at uh, one of our um, Hollywood leaders, Stan Lee. Did I say that right, Stan Lee? Okay, let's pull it up there. Stan Lee, just so you guys know, uh, movie uh, producer, guru in Hollywood, all those Marvel movies, this guy did it. Sooner or later, if any, this is him, this is what he says, sooner or later, if any man is to be worthy of his destiny, whoa, if man wants to be worthy of our, how many of you guys want to be worthy of our destiny? He gives a secret right now, you ready? This is all you need to do. You must fill your heart with tolerance, accept everything to get your destiny. Let's look at uh, the governor of Washington, what he just said when, um, uh, when he signed in Washington to be a sanctuary state. He says, On this premise, this is why I just signed an executive order reaffirming our commitment to what? Tolerance, Tolerance, diversity, and inclusiveness. I have just signed over our state to accept everything and everyone's right and everybody knows the truth and every point is valid and everybody is going to be accepted here. But here's the deal, you guys. This is what we hear from our politicians and and, and celebrities and, and... could put some Oprah probably up there, but I, I won't go there, not with Oprah. I'm just kidding. I would go there with Oprah. Okay. I just didn't have any, I just didn't look for anything from her. Okay. But um, let's look what happens at some of our, uh, at, at some of the pulpits in America. Now, I'm going to read a couple quotes. I'm not going to say the pastor's name because I just don't think I should, but I'm trying to make a point of what, how has tolerance made its way into the church? There's church in Michigan. Uh, called Christ's Community Covenant. Church has now changed its name to the C3 Exchange because Christ's Community Covenant is too offensive. Putting the word Christ in our church, too offensive to some people. We're going to call ourselves the C3 Exchange. And it has removed the cross from its church and anything that they put out. Saying this, that... The pastor compared using the cross as a symbol of Christ to that of using a bullet to remember Martin Luther King Jr. Too offensive. This is what he says about his church. Our community has been a really open-minded community. Okay, uh, uh, we have a number of Muslim people, Jewish people, Buddhists, atheists, all within their congregation. Why? Because when you accept everything, you stand for nothing give you another one. This is another uh, mega church. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, Teaches that all religions are valid. Even Osama bin Laden had the divine spark within him. And in a recent uh, uh, sermon, he said that Christianity is merely one of the sails that may be used to catch the wind of God's spirit. Too much tolerance. Another mega church pastor. If the church does it move off of its staunch stance of the Bible, it's going to render itself irrelevant. And he's talking about right there the idea that we have to stop calling everything sin. We have to start saying grace and love over everything. Stop calling homosexuality sin. Stop calling uh, abortion sin. If you can't get off of the Bible being the absolute truth, 
then you're going to render yourself irrelevant. Crazy world we live in. So I want to talk about this. What does God say about tolerance? Now, before we go any further, we need to define what tolerance is. Now, the old definition of tolerance, tolerance has taken a new definition. The old definition, I like the old definition. I agree with, with the old way of tolerance. The old way of tolerance was this, defined by um, treating with integrity, dignity, and humility a person whose opinion I consider to be untrue or invalid. Like, I agree with that. Like, that's a great thing for a Christian to do. What does that mean? That means that I may have homosexual friends, and I disagree with their lifestyle. And I would say, and this is crazy. Are you guys ready for this? Everybody take a deep breath. Homosexuality is a sin. Okay, there, I said it. Now it's out, okay? And, 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 and here's the thing, though. I love those people still. This is tolerance. This is, if, if we had a, um, uh, oh gosh, I don't want to get into that yet. But if we had a homosexual couple in here, I'm opening you with open arms. I'm going to love the Jesus into your situation and help you out of that lifestyle. That's real tolerance. But the new definition of tolerance is this. The acceptance of every viewpoint as equally true and equally valid. Don't even try to speak out against homosexuality because you are not right. Do not try to speak out against gender confusion. How many genders do we have now? There used to be two, now we have what? 30, whatever it is. It's crazy. Um, do not speak out against abortion. Hey, put this coexist sticker on your car right, right underneath the foothills one, okay? <laughs> the new definition of tolerance is not like any type of tolerance the Bible talks about. Let's look at what the Bible says about tolerance. We're going to go into um, 1 Samuel. We're going to stay there for pretty much the entire story. We're going to be looking at the life of Eli. Eli is a great leader in the Bible, but I want to talk about who Eli is before we start looking into um, the story of Eli, because there's some things we need to know. We're going to look at his life as a whole and find out what we can learn. So first thing we need to know about Eli, uh, we're not going to get to the scripture yet, but the first thing we need to know about Eli is Eli carried two positions in Israel. The first position that he carried was he was a judge. Now, a judge was, was the closest thing that Israel had to a king. He was the civil leader. He was the, the guy that was in charge. All of the judges in the Bible, they helped uh, lead Israel out of oppression from somewhere. He was the judge. But he wasn't only the judge. This is something that's unique to him. He was also the high priest. He had two roles, roles. First, the civil leader, and then the religious leader. And, and I don't know, we don't know much about Eli's early life, but we know that it had to be pretty profound, and he had to do some great things and, and um, show some true love for God because this high priest thing, this is interesting. God took during him, in fact, actually, let's, uh, let's put up that scripture. I'll explain it through the scripture. 1 Samuel 2, 30 says this, Therefore, the Lord of Israel declares... I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. See, what God had said to him is this. I'm going to take the high priest um, uh, off of the sons of Eleazar and put it on the sons of Ithamar, which, is, which Eli was. He took the high priest and he transferred it on to Eli's people. What must have Eli been like for God to do that, make him judge and high priest? We don't really meet him until later on in the Bible, but even later on in his life, he's got, he, he seems pretty great. He's a good man. He shows reverence for the temple of God. He shows reverence for the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, remember, he deals, he deals great with Hannah when Hannah comes and, and presents her, her case. He deals well with her. He raises Samuel. Remember Samuel in the Bible? Samuel is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He raises Samuel. He teaches Samuel to love God. He teaches Samuel how to be a prophet, how to hear from God. But here's the thing. When we look at Eli's life, we see the end of his life so different than the beginning of his life. We see the end of his time in the Bible so different from the beginning. At the end of the Bible, we find that he, he dies disgraced along with two of his sons. 
the high priest stripped from his family, Israel defeated, and the Ark of the Covenant captured. What happened? What went on? What could have happened? What were the fatal flaws that happened? What is the process that led Eli to that place? And what can we learn from his story? You guys ready to learn what happened? How? What, what took place? Well, first scripture that we need to do. First thing we need to do is we need to see the times in which Eli lived. Now, if you look at uh, Judges, we're, we're going to be in Samuel most of the time, but Judges, it, it, chronologically, Judges go all the way and then 1 Samuel begins. So when you look at the last part of Judges, it's speaking of the time of Eli. So let's look at that last verse, Judges 21 through 25. We learn something about the times in which Eli reigned. In those days, there was no king in Israel, just judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I want to stop here. As the civil leader and as a religious leader, whose job was it to confront corruption? Whose job was it to confront evil? Eli's. Whose job was it to pull the people out of paganism and bring it to the Lord? Eli's, whose job was it to challenge what was going on? Eli's. But we find that Eli did not confront these things. Instead, he tolerated these things. There's that word. Eli, instead of confronting them, he tolerated them. Now, first thing I want to say is we find ourselves in this a similar place as Eli found himself. You guys, would you guys ever say that the world we live in right now they do, do things that they think is right in their own eyes. You guys know that right now we are at war with moral relativism. The idea that right and wrong is not defined by any norm, any Bible or any certain thing. There is no absolute right and wrong. There is only what you decide is right and wrong or what you decide is right and wrong. That we get to define it for ourselves based out of our own experiences. You guys, what would happen if I defined what was right and wrong? Oh Lord, the world would end. Like, I'm going to be real right now. We would all be eating ice cream because it is the law. <laughs> right and wrong, it is that there is a war of who gets to define right and wrong. The society around us, the world around us, Hollywood around us, politicians, you name it, they all say the same thing right now. So many of them are saying the same thing that you can't tell me what's right and wrong because you don't have ultimate right and wrong. Therefore, you need to accept everybody else's right and wrong. You need to be tolerant of everything, accept everything, and be permissive of everything. Otherwise, you are a bigot. We find ourselves in the same place Eli didn't agree with what was going on, but he tolerated it. He didn't like the paganism in Israel, but it was easier to ignore it. But I promise you this one thing. What we tolerate will come out to get us. What we allow to pass will always cause problems. Because tolerance can cost us everything. And we're going to see what it cost Eli. What happens when people don't stand up for what is right, for what is true, for what is righteous, and stand against what is evil? What happens? Well, let's look right now. 1 Samuel 2.12. One of the things we're going to first see, what did tolerance and acceptance cost Eli? First, let's look at what it personally cost him. Now... The sons of Eli were what? Worthless. Worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now, I believe that Eli loved his sons. I believe that he prayed for them and that he wished that what was going on in their life wasn't. And, and he wished they would choose right. And I, and I believe all these things. But the problem was, as a civil leader, uh, Eli was too tolerant. But as a father, he was too permissive. 
He allowed things to happen. He didn't challenge his sons when they needed to be challenged. He didn't call out what was wrong. He allowed it to happen. They stole, when you look at his sons, because it talks about what his sons did, they stole from God. They stole from other people's sacrifices to God. They seduced women at the temple. They took by force. They took by bribe. They were worthless men. How did this happen? Because what Eli tolerated. Now, I want to stop real quick, and I want to talk specifically to us parents. If you're a parent of a younger person, I want a, a, of younger kids that are, that are influential, or if you're a grandparent and you have influence with those little kids, this message matters to us the most right now because God requires more out of us in this time about not being tolerant and about standing on right and wrong than other times in our life because we have influence over our kids. You know, I deal with um, people, I, I, I meet with people regularly, and, and this is something that I hear a lot. I have a parent that comes to me and says, help me with my older adult kid. You know, the truth is, sometimes it's too late. Eli, Eli went and finally confronted his kids, but it was too little, too late. And sometimes, and I, I want to make sure that we don't get stuck in that. You can't come back as your kids are 18, 19, 20, 21 and try to fix what you tolerated before, can you? You know, not all kids uh, start acting bad because of what we tolerated. Some are just like, I'm going to be evil, okay? Like, like no matter what you do, dad, right? But I want to talk to us parents right now. We have an incredible job in front of us. And we have to decide, are we going to be permissive parents? Or are we going to take a hard line? You know, I believe that by my parenting with my kids, that I'm going to help them love righteousness because I'm going to choose it. Because I'm going to choose what they watch. And I choose what they watch. In fact, right now during summer, we're on a no secular summer. It means they don't get to listen to, non, to any secular music at all. Like, I don't care what it is. Barney, no thank you. Even though it's not bad, uh, it's horrible in one sense. You don't get to listen to it. It's, it's not Christian. They don't get to watch movies that aren't Christian. They don't get to do any of that kind of stuff because there's no secular summer. This is a Jesus summer. I get to choose that. As parents, we either accept everything, tolerate everything, or we put up blocks. You know, and it's not easy because my kids come to me and say, oh, dad, this kid gets to watch this movie. I'm like, I don't, I'm not that kid's parents. I'm your parent. And you don't get to watch that movie. This kid gets to look at these YouTube videos. No way are you looking at those YouTube videos. <laughs> My kids, like, don't even really fully understand what YouTube is because, dad, it's so bad. There's so many problems with it. You know what my kids get to do? They get to watch Heather and I read the Bible. We choose things that are right, and we don't tolerate everything. They get to choose that. I mean, they get to see us do devotions with them. And the coolest thing that we're doing right now, this is not in any of my other sermons, is um, we've changed our devotions. Normally, I do it with them. But every single Monday, one of my two oldest kids do the devotions. It's so rad. We go into my living room, and I put up a pulpit. And they stand, and we all sit out. They make us announce, and it's the cutest thing. All right, now coming all the way from the room next door is Gavin Hoffman, and he walks out, and he's got his notes. It's the best. It's I love it. Partly because I don't have to do it. <laughs> That's not true. We help him. But I want to encourage you as a parent right now. It is time to stand on what's right for your kids. It's time to stand and realize that there's absolute right and there's absolute wrong. I got a call from uh, one of my buddies who's really close to him. I just want to give you, because it's not as easy as it sounds. He calls me and he says, Neil, I need your help. We've got a situation. I'm like, what's the situation? He says, I've got this family that um, we've been uh, friends with for a long time, going on vacation and all kinds of stuff together. And they've got their daughter, who's not very old, very young daughter, that has decided that she's now a boy. And the parents have embraced it. And it's, it's been kind of subtle for a long time. She wears boy clothes and goes to boy bathrooms. But we've kind of been able to shift around it. But they just, they're going out on vacation with um, a bunch of families. And the parents called all the fa family them, the other families and said, from now on, we want you to address our daughter as, I forget what the name was, Tyler. 
And he's like, I can't do that. I can't address her as Tyler. I can't accept that. Hey, good parent, huh? I can't ask my kids to do that because if I accept it, I endorse it. And so we talked, and, um, and he had a hard decision to make. It's not always easy. You know, parenting, it's not always easy. I had another couple come up to me and say that they're, um, eh, it doesn't matter. I gave enough examples. Um, it's not always easy. But as parents, we need to decide, hey, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. And even if it's offensive a little bit, I have to stand for the sake of my kids on what's right. Amen. Um, for Eli, it was too little and it's too late with his kids. Tolerance cost him his kids, but that's not all that tolerance cost him. Because let's look at what happened to the nation of Israel. One day later, the Israelites attacked the Philistines to gain back their land and, and to get their freedom. But God wasn't with them. They have moved away from God. He was no longer helping them. And Israel was defeated that day and 4,000 men died. So the army calls back to Eli's two worthless kids. And they say, hey, go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it out to battle. See, they weren't really trying to get God. What they were trying to do is use the Ark of the Covenant as a magic box to win the war. So Eli's sons, it's what they do. They go out there and they grab it. It was a bad time. They grab it, they bring it out, and let's read what happens. 1 Samuel 4, 10 through 11. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. God wasn't with them. I'm going to tell you this right now. If we won't stand for God, how can he stand with us? If, if I walk away and I won't stand for him, I'm going to stand over here. How can he stand with us? He's tied to the Bible. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and every man fled to his own tent and the slaughter was very great. For there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons Eli, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That's where it stops? Oh, yeah, that is where it stops. Because I'm supposed to say this. That all happened because Israel was too tolerant. Eli was too permissive, and they stopped standing on what was right. So out of that battle, one guy runs back to report back to Israel and to Eli what happened. Let's read that, that next passage, 17. Then the one who brought the news replied, and he's talking to Eli, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons, also Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. And when they mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backwards beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. And thus he judged Israel for 40 years. Listen, we will be judged for what we tolerate. Christianity... I want to make sure we all understand something. Christianity is not about a bunch of individuals. God has never called us to be a bunch of individuals. My job is not to make sure that Neil Hoffman doesn't sin, and if I do that, I win. God has called us over and over and over in the Bible a people. We are a people. We are a community. We are a corporation. We are all of us right here. And my job and your job as a Christian is not to worry simply about sins of admission, but to worry about sins of omission. What are the sins of omission? It's the things that you didn't do, isn't it? The things, the, the sins of of not doing things, of not standing up for what's right, of not standing on the Bible, of not standing up for righteousness when righteousness is attacked. And sometimes that means doing it in other people's life. Other people need us, and they need us to help them out of their situations. Um, Heather and I were, uh, were looking for a new car. We've got a family of a lot, and um, actually it's funny. <laughs> I got five kids, and we go places, and people are like, oh, are you guys Mormon? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, 
So we're, we have a minivan that we no longer fit into, so we have to buy like a big old passenger van with that family. And so we decided, okay, let's go to the dealerships, let's test drive their uh, passenger vans, see which one we like, and then not buy one there, buy one used, right? <laughs> so we go to the uh, Nissan dealership, and um, we're like, yeah, we want to check out your passenger van. The sales guy's like, oh, yeah, let's do this. Go in. So we walk up to this passenger van. It's called the Nissan NV, and, um, and we get inside of it, but he's like, let me back it up because it's in this really tight spot. Yeah, let's do that. So I'm sitting in there, and it's got the backup camera and everything. Like, backup cameras has changed our lives, right? It's one of, like, the greatest inventions in parking. Okay, so this guy's pulling out, and I'm looking at the backup camera from the passenger seat, assuming that he's a professional. <laughs> this is what he does for a living, right? And I'm sitting there, and there's this pole. The pole's way back there, okay? There's this pole way back there, and you could see it so clearly in the backup camera, and we are in a brand new expensive vehicle. And he starts backing up, and I think, he's not going to hit that. And as he starts getting closer and he's not slowing down, I think, I hope he doesn't hit that. And then I think, should I say something? I'm like, not going to say something, because he can see it's right there. And then all of a sudden, wham! In this brand new car, he hits this pole so hard, the light is like swinging back and forth in the air. And then he, I'm like, oh man, you, uh, uh, there's this backup camera right here. And I'm thinking, I wish I would have said something. So then he wedges it all up. I'm not making up the story. This is real things that happened with Neil. Okay. And he's got to back up down this aisle and then turn into the aisle to get out. So he's backing up, but at this point, I know. Dude knows that there's a backup camera now, so he's good. And I'm looking in the backup camera, and there's a brand new Nissan Murano behind us. It's a ways behind us, but I think <laughs> the guy learned his lesson. I don't need to say anything, okay? He already crashed once. He's not going to crash again, right? I don't need to say anything. And there we are gaining speed. <laughs> And I'm looking in the, the back of camera, and again, I'm thinking, do I need to say anything? Like, should I say, wham, into a brand new Murano. He pulls forward, looking in the camera. You can see the bumper's down, and the grill is split broken. I'm like, jeez. So he pulls down the aisle. He's like, hey, I'm going to get the gas car. We need to get gas. He's so embarrassed. He's like, why don't you drive? I'm like, yeah, because I don't want to die. I'm going to drive. You guys, you ever, you ever just watch people crash in their lives? They just go from one crash in their life to another crash in life, and you're like, don't you see the road signs? Well, how can you not see? You know, the honest truth is because they're blind to it, and that's why God put us in their life to tell them what is right and what is wrong. We can help them not crash all over the place. That's part of our job. We need to stop being so tolerant and accepting of everything and stand in the place of righteousness and say, my friend, that is sin. Sin is going to cost you, but it doesn't have to cost you. Amen. I wish that car story ended. <laughs> Let's keep going with it. So we go to the gas station across the street, and I'm using all my mirrors. Okay, I'm doing a good job. Pull into the gas station, stop, and the guy jumps out to go fill up the gas. And I'm, me and Heather are looking, Heather and I are looking throughout the car, seeing all like the stuff that it has, talking about it. And I hear him out of the side of my ear go, all right, uh, let me just put, uh, fill it up with some diesel. <laughs> Friend, this is not a diesel truck. At this point, I realize something. If I don't say anything, he doesn't know. Now, I know, Okay. So I jump out of the truck, run around the side. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Don't put diesel in the car. He's got the green handle. It's like going into the gas tank. And he looks at me. He's like, no, this is a big car. I'm like, yes, but it's not a diesel. See that word unleaded? It means no diesel. <laughs> I saved him from ruining the entire car. Listen, we've got to speak up more. You know that? It's a funny analogy, but we've got to speak up more. God, he puts it on us to help everybody else because sometimes when you're in the middle of something, you can't see clearly. But someone else standing out can say, there's a pole. Don't do it. 
No, I gotta find myself. Here's the neat thing about this story. We get to find out what happens immediately after Eli because we have the Bible. In fact, once Eli's done being the judge, uh, Samuel becomes the judge. He's known as the last judge and the first prophet. It's Samuel. And we just get to look and see, well, what does Samuel do? Does Samuel follow in Eli's steps and tolerate everything? The answer is no. You guys ready to see what Samuel does? Samuel's crazy. I like this guy. Okay, let's read this first. 1 Samuel 7, 3 through 4. Says this, when Samuel spoke, no, then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, this is just a couple chapters later. If you return with all your heart, listen to him right now. This is, not the, this is not a guy that accepts everything. This is not the tolerant police or the politically correct Samuel. If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone and serve him with everybody else. No, serve him alone. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Does that sound like a guy that knows what's right? And know there's one way to righteousness. There's one way to be right. There's one way out of the bondage to the Philistines. There's one way to freedom. And it's following God. It's looking to him. And if Israel, if you'll turn away from the idols, if you'll turn away from your paganism, and if you will stand on what is right, then God will save us. Dude, that guy's awesome. One of the reasons why it's my favorite, one of my favorite Bible characters. What Eli tolerated, Samuel confronted. See that? What Eli tolerated, Samuel immediately addressed. This is what he did. He said, if we don't stand for God, then he won't stand for us. So Israel, let's get up. Let's walk over to where God is. Let's camp out and let him, let him stand for us. You guys ready to see what happened? Let's go to the next part. Uh, 1 Samuel 7, verse 5 and around. <laughs> See all those verses. Then Samuel said, all right, everybody, turn from all these things. He said, gather all of Israel to Mitzpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. I'm going to repent because you're a bunch of sinners. Now, when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mitzpah, the Lord of the, of the Philistines went up against Israel, like, dude, everybody's together. Let's just go, like, smash on them a little bit. And when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines, and they said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord God for us, and, or that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Now, Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near battle to battle against Israel. Okay, wait, I'm gonna stop right here. So here, let's just paint this picture. They live this life tolerating everything, everybody doing what was right in their own eyes, war against what's right and wrong. They live this way under Eli and they were defeated. Samuel comes up and says, I will tolerate no more. I will confront all of it and I will stand on what's right. The Philistines go to attack them. Remember, they just were defeated. It just happened under Eli. Now, what happens when we stand with God? Right here. But the Lord thundered, say thundered, thundered. with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines, and he confused them so that they were, re they were routed before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines, struck them down as far as below Bethkar. A stinking men, Right? What happens when we stand up for God? God stands with us. Sometimes it's scary to stand up for what's right, but remember, God stands with you. You don't stand alone. Sometimes it's hard in your workplace to uh, come up and confront wrong and evil. Sometimes it's hard to stand what's right, but remember this. We don't stand alone. God stands with us. Just as Samuel got the freedom, we can stand up for righteousness. And not only will we get more freedom in our life, people around us will experience freedom. Let's get the band up here. I want to um, read two quotes that, I, I, that are just so great I don't want to miss them. Dorothy Sayers says this. Like, 
like these are really powerful. I really want to think about these in the words of tolerance. Dorothy Sayers says this. It is called tolerance. The sin that believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive because there's nothing for which it to die. If we stand for everything, we stand for nothing. We'll fall for everything. And the last one, I think I'm going to frame this in my house or in my office and put it in my car. I want you to listen to, to the voice behind this guy, what he says. It's Abraham Kuyper, the, the power behind what he believes. And this is what he says. When the principles that run against your deepest be, uh, convictions begin to win the day. For me, that's today. There are a lot of things that run against my deepest convictions today. He says, when the principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, the battle is your calling and peace has become sin. You must, at the price of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy with all the fire of your faith. Amen for people like that. Let's stand up right now. We have before us a choice. How are we going to live? There is a war for what is right. It's the war of moral relativism against moral absolutes. It is a war and it, we're all in it. What are you going to do? Where are you going to find yourself? Because we're either going to find ourselves tolerant, apathetic, permissive, acceptive of everything or we have a fight on our hands for what is right.